when you're just beginning in real estate development, how are you seeking the team, the general contractors, the HVAC, the architect, the electric team? How are you sourcing this team? What avenues were you using to get them? Well, I started off in the real estate business as a real estate appraiser. So my career started, I was appraising, um, you know, houses, single family houses that were applying for HUD mortgage insurance. So low to moderate income housing. And that's how I started. And then I scaled up to doing commercial, small commercial, and then some larger commercial. So I understood some of the economics of a project. And so I understood who was, you know, in some of the space. But I asked around. I had friends and I had people that, you know, I knew in the business, some of my clients on the appraisal business side that were developers. So I wasn't afraid to ask them questions about how would I do this? Who's a good architect for this kind of building? And and so on. And so I, I got a lot of people to give me advice and guidance and I listened to a lot of it and then made it, you know, made made the step to go and work on my first office building. I mean, my first building that I built as a developer was actually a $10 million building that's probably today a $75 million building. But back then, and when I started on it in 1987, um, it was, you know, a um, $10 million building. And so I had to hire an architect and a contractor. My lawyer introduced me to an architect and introduced me to a contractor. And, uh, and then the mayor of the city actually introduced me to the president of a bank. And that president of the bank became my lender, ultimately. A broker friend of mine um, introduced me to some, small, some real estate uh, investors, and they ended up being my equity partner on coming into the deal. And so that deal, um, I learned from you know, other relationships I had. And ultimately, I, did, um, I partnered with these investors. They, got, they put up all the money and got half the deal. I did the work, got the other half and uh, still on that building today. Um, but that's how I started. And I think the thing that I, I think is important to understand about real estate, especially real estate development, is you can start off very small. I mean, I was going around Washington, D.C., appraising low-income housing, and then you know went from there to um, building buildings for the ultra-rich. So, I mean, you can go as far as your vision and your hard work are going to take you. And it's the same blueprint, by the way. So let me ask you this, as far as um, this is relevant to any real estate investor, whether they're investing in a single family home or they're trying to buy an apartment building or that they're, they're trying to be a developer. Market analysis, right, um, is extremely important. So what is your process? What do you conduct as far as um, what's best practices for your company when it comes to market analysis? And what should people know when they're looking at different markets to invest in or to develop it? Very good question. So, so you got to look at what the purpose of the investment is. So if the purpose of the investment is to buy a small apartment building, then you're looking for income stream, right? So then there you want to look at the marketplace and see what other buildings are renting for based on that are similar to yours. And then you can figure that you should be able to compete within that space. And if you build a, a slightly better uh, building or renovate the building that you are buying, then maybe you can move the rent up a little bit. And that's kind of how you would understand the market there on the single family side, that you would look at what other people are paying for houses, similar houses. And that would be your guide as to how you could determine value. And then how robust is the market? I mean, that's in both rentals and sales. You want to know how active are apartment buildings having high vacancies. I mean, if it's anything like 5% or less, then it's it's a, essentially 100% occupied. It's only vacant when people are moving in and out. Um, a healthy market is like 10% vacancy. How long does it take to sell um, a house in the marketplace where you're in? If, if houses are selling within six months or less, that's a good pace. If they're selling in less than three months, or you know, then it's a very active market. But if it's taken a year or year and a half and properties are still sitting on the market, that's probably not the neighborhood or market you want to build into. And so you're looking at activity within the market, either rents, comparable rents and co similar buildings or comparable sales of similar units. And that same economic approach on market goes to whether you're analyzing a two unit duplex or you're analyzing a hundred unit apartment building 
or whether you're doing a single family house or a 50 unit condo building. The, the economics are that you're looking at comparable sales for projects that you're going to build to sell and rents for what you're going to be renting. And if you were doing an office building, you go through a similar analysis, but based on what tenants are paying. If you're going to do a retail store, it's the same analysis. So you spoke about being starting your career in the appraisal process, and I think that's an interesting process. We've seen the stories of discrimination inside that process. I experienced it firsthand, what that's like. What do you think there's are solutions for that? Is it us being more aware of that process, being more involved? And if so, how do we go about it? Well, what has happened is that throughout history in this country, especially in, in terms of uh, financing homes, there's been redlining that has taken place. It's not as overt anymore, but back in, you know, before the 1970s, there were areas in different cities around the country where lenders would kind of carve out with a red line on their maps of where they wouldn't make loans. And those were predominantly black communities. And it wouldn't matter what the employment levels were in those communities. It was based on race. What we see more now is that uh, areas that are, um, you know, uh, our, our mixed income, for example, um, and diverse, they tend to be looked at um, in, the, in the intangibles less favorably. Like they'll, the, an appraiser will uh, imply or impute a longer marketing term. It'll impute a discount to sales prices. It'll impute a higher interest rate um, or high cap, higher capitalization rate on an apartment building. So it penalizes it in the, the intangibles and nuances. And I think the, the way we get beyond that is to recognize that this still exists and to challenge it. I think what happens is, is that if someone gets an appraisal and it hurts their ability to borrow, they kind of accept it. And what you can do is you can push back and you can challenge it, for example. And you can tell the lender that you want to challenge it. You get a, you're entitled to a copy of it. And then you can do your own research. Go look at the comparable sales. Did they miss some? What did they do? And see if that is right. Sometimes the appraisals are right. Many times they are. And sometimes they're not. And so if you find um, inaccuracies or, or anomalies in them, then you can bring that to the bank and contest its valuation. And then they're obligated to actually send that to their appraisal department and give you a response. 